case, the final frontier. These are the voyages of the Starship Seg Segotep. It's the, st it's the Segotep EDI, it's back. This is a computer case, it's a micro ATX case. We've got a mini ITX board in there for better, well, size compatibility, but this is a computer case. We did a stream building in this case a while ago, and now that we've had some time to really work with it and think about it, we're here with a full review. In fact, this particular case was so popular with our viewers that uh, Uniway, the distributor that's based in Canada where we, we bought this case, Uniway contacted us to say that they had sold out of the case and that they were back ordered. So now we're back to review this thing properly. Before that, this video is brought to you by EVGA's new keyboards. EVGA's new Z20 and Z15 RGB optical mechanical gaming keyboards have abundant RGB LEDs and programmable macro keys on the left side of the keyboard. They also have a sensor to detect and turn on the LEDs when you're in front of the keyboard and turn them off when distant, offering a unique feature for keywords. The keyboard claims a 0.5 millisecond response time and 100 million keystroke lifespan. Learn more at the link in the description below. We really weren't expecting this, but reviewing this case has taught us something incredibly important about the industry, and it's that the designers of the ATX standard back in 1995 or AT in 1984 were not planning for aerodynamic computers. It's really sad because this case has, has proven that point. Uh, it has tried all it can to be aerodynamic, but alas, the AT and the ATX standard has made it very difficult to do so. We'll give credit to Segotep though for trying. They've got hood scoops, it's got the sweep to the dome so that air can come over it when it's, well, there's no air in space, but when, it, when it's moving quickly, presumably it will help. But the case itself, it was about $200 when we bought it from Uniway. It has a, as you can see by the back plate here, has a pretty standard just I.O. orientation, except it's horizontal, which you see in some of the smaller form factor cases. This isn't a particularly small form factor because there's a lot of dead space in here that's used to accommodate the look of the enclosure. And this is a case that is sold based on how it looks, and that's totally fine. We have a case that looks like a cat back there that we're fairly fond of uh, when we reviewed that case. So doing something genuinely unique like this always gets our attention because there's so much cool stuff that can be done with computers and it can still be kept in a way that's fairly function focused. It just looks different. And that's what we like to see. We've seen it with video cards, like in particular, the Cute Pet RX 580, I think it was, RX 580 2048. And we've seen it with cases and like this case. There's still issues with this case, just like any other. And a lot of them are the same that other cases have. So. Ultimately, what you end up with is something unique and something sort of, historically, you would almost have to mod yourself if you wanted an enclosure that looked like a spaceship for your computer. But when things are available retail at 200 bucks, that's in a price range where, yes, it is high for a computer case, but 200 isn't unreasonable if you want something completely unique. Now, what'll matter is the quality of it. If it's $200 and the quality's garbage, then obviously it's a different story. But if it's $200 and you get something unique that fits a, a really specific theme that you are personally very fond of and want to have more of in your life, like space or uh, cats, I suppose, then that's a good place to be for the computer industry where we've commoditized it to a point that having something different is a strong selling point rather than just always focusing on black and red gamer aesthetic. Anyway, let's get into the review. We'll go through Patrick's build section and then talk about if we think this thing's actually worth it now that we've been through several build cycles with it. The appearance of the case is definitely interesting. Audience opinion during the live stream we did was divided between outright hatred on one hand and instantly opening another tab to shout out $200 on the other hand. The case is covered with small vents, including what are effectively designed as hood scoops. These are real in the sense that they are actually open vents, which lead into the body of the case, but none of them are positioned to do much if the case isn't flying through the air at 100 miles an hour. Although, surely our editors can show it flying through space. Not that air scoops would be particularly useful in space, but it would look cool. It looks right at home as a TNG away shuttle or escape pod, and with just a couple of gallons of beige paint, it'd be ready for Picard. The shell is entirely molded plastic with a tinted translucent window over the front two thirds of the case. 
The tint is extremely dark. Nothing without LEDs is visible on the K's interior. Adding some lighting strips to illuminate the interior could lead to some cool builds. There are three LEDs that are included with the case. Two of those are bright blue power LEDs on either side of the power button, and one is just a yellow LED that projects the Segotep logo onto the surface underneath the case. The lens over this LED appears to be off-center or partially obscured, but the projection is unaffected. The shell is supported by solid aluminum runners, and when we say solid, we mean solid. We're not experts in metal casting, but it seems like these may have been cast as a single piece, and the aluminum components here aren't cheap. The production of this unique piece is undoubtedly a big chunk of the case's cost. Opening the case is an interesting puzzle since it doesn't have a manual. There are no obvious handles, and it's difficult to see inside at all. The trick is that the rear plastic panel is attached with magnets, and it can be pulled straight backwards into off of the case, revealing two thumb screws hidden underneath. The panel on ours was so sticky that it required some wiggling, and after removing it for the first time, we found that one of the magnets had fallen off and remained stuck to the chassis receiving magnet. The panel also doesn't seem to have been cleaned very thoroughly after the molding process, and there are dirty fingerprints and smudges still visible on the underside. These mostly appear to be oil stains from working with whatever fluid the factory has in the manufacturing process, and could be, for the most part, scrubbed off. The panel is completely cosmetic, so Segotep actually deserves some credit for including the rear panel. It's on the back of the case, which is unlikely to be seen in normal use, unless maybe it's at a trade show floor, but even the back of the case looks as spaceship-y as possible. There are holes in the panel for all I.O., all PCIe slots, and two holes for PSU cables so that power supplies can be installed fan up or fan down. They should be installed fan down, though. Once the thumb screws are removed, the top of the cockpit can be pulled off. It's secured with run-of-the-mill plastic clips, the alligator style, which is a bit of a disappointment. We half expected a press button to see it hinge up and open like a spaceship. Speaking of PCIe slots, all the slot covers below the primary one are disposable. That doesn't affect the case performance-wise, and the slots are almost entirely hidden at the rear of the case, but it does contribute to a low-budget impression for a case that doesn't have a low-budget price. As mentioned during our stream, one of the plastic clips had already broken after just two or three connection cycles. If the canopy isn't carefully aligned with the chassis when installed, it's easy to damage those clips, and it's very easy to misalign the canopy. If the plastic tabs at the back, the ones fastened by thumb screws, are inside the case rather than outside, the whole canopy is pushed forward a couple of millimeters. Front I.O. is made up of two USB 2.0 Type-A ports, one USB 3.0 Type-A port, two 3.5 millimeter audio jacks in and out, and a toggle for the Segotep logo projection. The power button is separate, with the button itself attached to the lower shell and the plastic insert that actuates the button on the upper shell. The I.O. was one of the more alarming aspects of the case, which we noticed during the stream. It's oddly spliced together wires running between the motherboard's power LED header, the projector on and off switch, the power LEDs, the projector LED, and a four pin Molex connector. The end result works fine, actually, but it has homemade quality that we don't normally see in mass produced cases. Then again, this particular component is probably not mass produced. The power button itself is a simple design. It's a plastic insert held up by a plastic spring, if we're being generous, tacked onto the shell over the button itself. The shape of the plastic combined with the sprue along the molded edges made the button sticky, and we had some unplanned reboots during testing when the button became stuck. Installing the canopy is almost guaranteed to hit the button, so you should make sure that the computer's off when you do that. This is something that could be solved with some sandpaper or some other light modding, but the design should be more robust. Two fan mounts are at the very rear of the case, two pre-installed 80 millimeter fans, that is, yes, 80 millimeters. Both fans were secure, but upon uninstalling them and inspecting where they were installed, we found multiple holes, some of which had already been previously stripped by over-tightening them on install at the factory. The third and final mount is at the front of the case on the plate in front of the motherboard tray. This fan is positioned above the same part of the vent that's used for the power supply intake. So it does actually have a chance to draw air into the case, although it has to rely on the curved canopy to direct that air towards the motherboard. Because of the shape of the case, cooler compatibility is limited. The case ceiling is surprisingly high, enough so that even large tower coolers almost fit, the keyword being almost. All of the tower coolers we had tried contacted the case ceiling on at least one corner. 
any square tower cooler using a 120mm or larger fan that has appropriate clearance for RAM will definitely not fit. That's unfortunate because there actually is a lot of open space inside of this enclosure and stock fans are positioned in a way that it would pull hot air directly out of a tower cooler. We compromised by installing a tiny tower cooler, the Arctic A13X, which is the smallest that we possess, and it was the only one compatible with this case. Our backup option was a stock AMD downdraft cooler, but the vertical tower matched the profile of the limited intake options better. Liquid cooling is essentially impossible. There's a single 120 mil fan mount in the case and using it to install a CLC would put the radiator at the same level or lower than most pumps, maybe not all of them though, uh, if they're in the radiator. Using a radiator here does potentially put the CPU cooler closer towards a source of cool air at the bottom of the case, but it obviously moves it further from the stock exhaust fans. This is a setup that Unaway has chosen for its particular product page images, but we can't really recommend it, at least not if the pump is located on the CPU block where it normally is, especially not in an exhaust down configuration which would conflict with these stock exhaust fans. Building inside the case is easy, which is something we're not used to saying about small form factor enclosures. Taking the canopy off converts it into an open test bench on a sled. And if desired, the entire motherboard tray and PCIe brackets can be unscrewed from the plastic housing and lifted out. We chose not to do this because there was no need, but it may be helpful when installing micro ATX motherboards, which are large enough to cover some of the cable cutouts. We used a mini ITX board to give us full access to everything. The metal plate at the front of the case with fan and SSD mounts is separate from the motherboard tray, so it has to be removed to temporarily install a fan. If no two and a half inch drive mounts are needed, they can be left out, but it's worth keeping around to mount a fan. We chose to install a fan on the bottom surface of the plate as near as possible to the vent on the bottom of the case. Doing this requires careful cable management though, to avoid damaging anything or tangling things up, since the only place to store loose cables is in the bottom chamber of the enclosure. The case is compatible with ATX power supplies, but longer units like the EVGA T2s that we use for internal testing will obviously not fit. This isn't unusual for most cases, but we only bring it up here because the lower chamber of this case is spacious enough that it could fit extremely large power supplies if it were shaped just a little bit differently. The tapered helicopter spaceship design isn't naturally suited to rectangular components. This applies to GPUs as well. Our initial plan for this test was to use the ASUS ROG Strix 3070. It's a massive card, measuring approximately 31 by 12.5 by 5.5 centimeters, not including the PCIe fingers, the I.O. shield, or the power cables. It almost fits in the Segotep EDI, but since the case roof curves downwards at the edges, one corner of the card bumps the canopy. The case is capable of fitting unusually long cards front to back, as long as the card isn't wide or too tall. Dual slot coolers that aren't much wider than the expansion slots, about 11 centimeters, would be the safest bet. In a typical case review, this section would be thermals and noise, but since the EDI comes with fairly low power fans and we're not using our standard bench components, there's really no point to doing noise because we're effectively just testing the CPU cooler, the GPU, and the PSU noise levels at that point, not the case. So we'll skip that. The components used were the R73700X at stock settings, so no PBO, with the Ryzen Balance Power Plan, Founders Edition RTX 3070, an ASUS B550i gaming ITX motherboard, two 8GB sticks of Triton Z Neo 3600MHz RAM, a Be Quiet Street Power 11 1200W power supply, and an Arctic A13X CPU cooler. For the thermally relevant components, so the cooler, the CPU, the motherboard, and the GPU, we tried to stick to components that we believe would be likely paired with a $200 novelty case. The NVIDIA Founders Edition cooler is unusual, but if anything, we believe it should perform better than a traditional axial cooler in this case, and it's two slots, so it would fit. There's no real path for GPU exhaust away from the side, but blowing it up towards the CPU should allow for the rear exhaust uh, and the fans to actually help the cart. During the stream, we added one 120 mil intake fan to the bottom of the case because we had concerns about the lack of any air intake whatsoever. This is the configuration we used for baseline testing, but we also did a test pass without that intake fan and a pass without the top of the case for more testing. CPU torture thermals are up first. For thermal testing, we used our typical full CPU and GPU torture workload. In the stock configuration, the CPU maintained a temperature of 57 degrees Celsius above ambient, a surprisingly under control temperature. The CPU isn't overclocked, and we gave the EDI the best chance possible with both case fans at 100% speed and the most well-suited air CPU cooler we could find. 
but we were still worried that the lack of ventilation of the A13X as an undersized cold plate combined with it would make the system maybe overheat. Adding the 120mm intake fan brought the temperature down a few degrees to 54, but the average core frequency during the load portion of this test didn't increase significantly, remaining at approximately 3970MHz with or without the intake fan. Taking the top off of the case entirely did massively cut the temperatures down, bringing them to 45 degrees average, but with a small increase in the average core frequency up to 4026 megahertz under load. The EDI isn't as bad as we feared for thermal so far. It doesn't mean it's good, but it could be made to work. We would normally control the GPU fan RPM during case testing, but we don't have any other data to compare against for this particular case. So we allowed the 3070FE to run its own fan curve, and then we plotted what that curve was. That means that the temperature averages with or without the intake fan are about the same at 54 degrees Celsius above ambient with the fan or 53 without because Nvidia has a VBIOS that determines a certain temperature target under certain conditions and that's what's being hit. The speed at which the GPU fans spin is the real story. Without the intake fan, the GPU fans averaged 2030 RPM under load. With the intake fan, they are averaged 1887 RPM and the GPU attempts to maintain a flat maximum temperature either by adjusting the fan speed or the boost frequency. So adding the intake fan allowed the 3070 to run at approximately the same core clock with a lower average fan speed. Taking the top off of the case lowered the average GPU temperature to 49 degrees and that allowed the cooler fans to drop to 1570 RPM and it allowed the core clock to rise a little bit under load. The biggest takeaway here is the fan speed drop and the noise accompanied with it. So wrapping this up then, the EDI is capable of cooling components. It's not particularly uh, adept at it, but if you focus on getting a couple of, like a, a fan in the center up front here does help a bit, and trying to get a small tower cooler will help because then you're aligning the tower with the rear exhaust rather than a downdraft where everything's just sort of fighting each other. So if you can get the right set of components together, it's capable of cooling well enough to be justifiable. This would not be a good solution, this case, if you wanted to do something like an RTX 3080 or 3090 or whatever, or 6800 XT to some extent, but especially 3080, 3090, and like a 5900X, 5950X, anything where you're in really high power consumption territory, this case will begin to struggle with because, well, it's good enough for our mid-range build we did here, 3700X, RTX 3070. That's kind of middle of the road power consumption. It's, it's a little on the high side with the 3070, but not crazy. But once you push past that, dealing with the heat will be a challenge and you'll need a way to, to try to, you'll probably need to modify the case to really adeptly deal with it, or you just put more powerful fans in there and run the CPU and the GPU cooler fans at a higher RPM, in which case you've dealt with the, the thermal problem, but you've created a noise problem. Whether or not that bothers you depends on kind of where the case is in your room or wherever it's being displayed. As a display piece, this is kind of fun and different. Uh, it's, it's, there's several things that I personally wish they had done with this. So this, whatever you call it, dome uh, windshield thing, we'd really like to see this pivot up. And it doesn't seem like mechanically that should be too difficult. Uh, but what we'd like to see is basically some hinges back here, maybe hidden on the inside of the case if possible. And then have the button here that's actually a power button right now that I think Patrick has maybe fixed, but it was sticking previously. Uh, we'd like to see that button just change to a simple latch and release. So completely mechanical, nothing crazy, but just to release it and be able to push the windshield up and then have it stick in place completely vertically so you can see the components. And the fact that it's completely blacked out looks neat externally, but uh, it does mean you can't see the computer. So if you put some LEDs in there, LED strips, it'll help, but it's still extremely, extremely tinted, very heavily tinted. Uh, so we'd like to see a few changes to how the front works and actually how the assembly works in general. The alligator clips for this top half of the shell will over time start to get damaged. You can preserve them if you're exceptionally careful every time you install it or remove it. But um, if you have a, a, a lapse in how careful you are for a moment, you can compress one of them and break it, which is not abnormal for alligator clips in any computer case. But in this one, it feels particularly bad since it's $200. For the materials overall, we're on the disappointed side for how they feel, the cleanliness, like having, ew, <laughs> it's actually still there. Having, <laughs> that's gross. Having some of the uh, like oil left from manufacturing and fingerprints and 
marks like that on a $200 novelty case that is purely built on the idea of how it looks, that's a, a downside. That's a letdown for sure. And these aluminum feet set, sleds basically, set a really high bar for case materials that make everything else that isn't as good as them really obvious. At the end of the day, we can't really hard recommend or recommend against the case because it's so subjective. Thermally, it's suitable if you're not going too hard with the high-end components. Uh, if you are, then probably find something else or do a mod to it. Mechanically, it there's a lot to be desired and materials wise and just sort of fit and finish like this stuff there's a lot to be desired but overall the concept is fairly well executed for something that's not really done otherwise and we can't fault it for trying to do something unique so if you like the idea of this then it's workable and if you don't like the idea of it then you can rest assured knowing that you don't need to buy it. Overall, it's something different and fun to work with as a reviewer, and maybe a couple of you in the audience really specifically want this thing, and if you get it, uh, do a mod of that window and tweet it to us, because we'd like to see that. That's it for this one, thanks for watching. Subscribe for more, you can go to store.cameronsaccess.net if you'd like to pick up one of our mouse mats, toolkits, or shirts, or other items, or you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus for extra Q&A and behind the scenes videos. Thanks for watching, we'll see you all next time.